Hello, my name is Jackie Cucci. I am the Madden Employees at Council on Aging Director, and we are pleased to start offering some programs today, uh, starting with tick borne diseases um, with Dr. Chowdhury. And we do have some people here in the audience, and we also have people here at the um, via Zoom. And we welcome all of you uh, to the Council on Aging, and we're hoping to do more programs in the future. Uh, this is our first time doing a hybrid. So hopefully it works out, and we're looking forward to um, any other topics that you might have. Through this program, Dr. Chowdhury will be talking about tick-borne diseases, and at the end of his formal presentation will be a little bit um, of a little bit more of a cartoon about how ticks actually take care of uh, connecting to you. So um, I'm, without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Chowdhury uh, from Metapoisa and uh, Infectious Disease um, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Chowdhury. I'm Dr. Chowdhury. I'm an infectious disease physician. Um, currently retired from private practice, but I still do some work at the hospital. Um, I've done some research on tick-borne disease and I'm going to give an overview of the tick-borne disease. It's just something, it's a large topic because there are multiple diseases. But I'm, I'm going to try and focus on Lyme disease, which is probably the most common disease in terms of tick-borne disease. And people have more questions about it. Um, ticks are very prevalent in this area. We are really in an endemic zone in terms of uh, tick-borne disease, especially in the months of spring and early summer, and some of the diseases can occur also in the late fall. These are the diseases we see in this area. Uh, the most common is, everybody is aware of, is Lyme disease. Uh, it's caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, the other common, other are uh, anaplasmosis, which is a bacterial infection that infects the white cells. And the other is the babesiosis, it's a parasite that infects the red cells. Uh, the fourth one is Borrelia miomotai, which is also similar to Lyme disease, but it does not cause rash, it causes similar symptoms. And then lastly is the Pavasa virus, which is also transmitted by the tick. These, all these diseases are transmitted by the one tick cause. <clears throat> Iodus scapularis. And these ticks can transmit more than one disease at a time. You can have Lyme disease and babesiosis. You can have Lyme disease and anaplasmosis. A lot of times there's more than one infection. This is the life cycle of the tick. It, the life cycle is over two years. Um, usually, the field mice, or the white-footed mouse, are the major reservoir for Lyme bacteria and also other tick-borne diseases, tick-borne diseases that are prevalent in this area. And what happens is, sometime in the summer, the, they hatch and get a blood meal from the white field mouse and then they mature and become nymphs. Those are the most dangerous ones that cause the infection. They are small and they hatch onto your, any part of your body while you're working outdoors and, and most people don't even realize it. It also secretes the saliva which allows it to hang on to the skin. It takes about 36 hours in order for somebody to be infected with Lyme disease after they've had the tick. And then what happens is it matures, it gets a blood meal either from a human being or another mouse and, and matures into an adult. They need the blood meal. We are accidental hosts. Humans happen to be accident hosts. We really do not, it is not person to person transmitted from per one person to the other. The only disease that is transmitted through a blood transfusion among this disease is Babesia. But otherwise, 
all of these are trying, you need a tick as an intermediary to get the disease. And then it becomes adult tick. The adult tick also can cause infection, but, a, uh, but it's less likely because most often they are much larger, they don't hang on to your skin, and people are aware of the tick. Humans are accidental hosts and they're infected through a bite of an immature nymph form, Iota scapularis, usually it's the female tick, it's not the male tick. <laughs> there are over 15 tick-borne diseases that have been reported in several parts of the country and infections vary depending on your ge geographical location. And there are also reports of tick-borne disease <coughs> all over the world whether in Russia, or Eastern Europe, uh, Europe, in Africa, so uh, in parts of Asia. And there are different kinds of diseases that are transmitted. See, a lot of times people, in the, this is where people get into trouble. In the summer, if they get fever, chills, myalgias, all these symptoms are very similar to flu. The only thing in the difference in Lyme disease, some people can get rash, some people may not get rash. So they, they just push it off saying, ah, I had a flu. And if you really look at the variation of the flu, if you look at this graph, the flu is most prevalent in the winter months, especially in an area like in the cold part of the country, mostly in December to March. Then as the spring comes in, Use. And then the summer, that's when you see the tick-borne disease. That's why I tell patients, don't call it summer flu. If you get symptoms like that, make sure you check for tick-borne disease. The Lyme disease symptoms can vary depending on your complex immune response to the bite. To the, or to the pathogen or to the bacteria. And again, people always talk about bullseye rash. It's not always bullseye rash. Most often the rash is a red rash that spreads. It's just a flat rash. And also you can have multiple patchy rash. See, like if you look at the picture, you can see the gentleman wants the picture above the multiple things, and the other one is a bullseye rash. You can have either one of them. And flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, headache, and joint pain is something that happens to all of this tick-borne disease. And that's why you can't really differentiate based on symptoms saying you got anaplasmosis unless you have the rash. Because other ones don't have rash. Co-infections are common, as I said, and the symptoms can overlap from each each of the disease. A lot of pain, most of the patients, when I talk to them, they don't even recollect a tick bite. In the early part of the Lyme disease, when somebody comes to me in the summertime or goes to a physician saying, this time of the year you were raking leaves last week, and you go to a physician and say, I had a headache followed by fever, chills, and I don't feel well, you need to be checked for Lyme, Lyme disease or other tick-borne disease. The Lyme tests are not, uh, not positive early on. The Lyme test is based on your immune response to the infection. It takes two to three weeks for the immune response to occur and for your antibodies to be positive. So usually physicians will make a diagnosis of Lyme disease based on your symptoms or tick-borne disease based on your symptoms. The PCR is a test which is very rarely positive. I'm not going to go into it. And usually the first test, there are major two major antibodies in our body, IgM and IgG. The IgM, any infection, doesn't matter what the nature of the infection, it could be measles, it could be mumps, if you get it, the first responder is IgM. So the IgM goes up in the first six weeks, then the IgG starts to rise, 
that's how we can differentiate if somebody had a recent disease or has had this disease for some time. These are some of the complications that occur with early in the part of the disease, what we call a stage 2 disease in Lyme disease. Most common is the meningitis, usually patients have Bell's palsy or facial nerve palsy. Their mouth is crooked, they can't close their eye, and usually that's an early sign. And usually if you develop that, you should seek uh, advice and those patients. Very rarely you see inflammation of the heart, usually it's a seen in young men. And that's one of the few times you really need to be careful and the patient needs to be hospitalized. There have been rare deaths. The other thing is, other common complication is the pain that occurs along your nerve roots, especially in the back of the back or in the, in the chest, and that can be very painful. And these patients, because they're usually by these complications occur about six or seven weeks after the infection, the Lyme test is always positive. Late Lyme disease, the most common symptom is your joint swells up. A major joint like a knee, elbow, or an ankle, that's the most complication, common complication. Most of those patients come to us saying my joint hurts or it's been swollen for, for a week. And usually they don't have any other symptoms. They don't even recollect having a tick bite. And often you really have to dig in, saying that you had the flu-like symptoms a year ago or last fall, and most of those patients don't. And that is one of the most difficult ones to treat. Then the other ones are can cause nerve pain, can involve the nerve root, or very rarely it involve the brain, and very rare complications. Those are very, very rare. We really don't see. And one of the ways to diagnose this is indeed the, the joint swelling is secondary to Lyme disease, is to take the fluid out and send it for a specific test called the PCR test, which is very diagnostic. If I'm being very technical, please. One of the things, very misnomer, is one of the problems with Lyme test is it's an antibody test. It's like, say, you had measles, or you had mumps, measles, rubella vaccine. If 10 years after you had the vaccine, you will still have antibody. Similarly, Lyme disease, antibody remains positive even after you've been treated properly. It can remain positive for many years. Actually, the guy who discovered Lyme disease, um, he's in Mass General, I'm, I'm blocking his name, but um, early on uh, in Lyme, Connecticut, they had a group of children which had arthritis and initially were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and then he discovered this was not due to uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it's due to a bacteria, and he did, that's how he discovered it. So, in fact, when he went back and looked at some of those children, their arthritis was still positive, many years later. That's why it's called Lyme disease, because it's Lyme Connecticut. <laughs> We do not really, if once you have been properly treated, especially if you are treated early on, we do not recommend repeat testing because they're going to be positive, just a waste of money, waste of time, and really, especially if you have no symptoms. And even if you have some residual symptoms, you don't really need to do it. And also, you need to understand the titles will take at least six months for them to go down. So it's, uh, and the other common problem is there is Lyme IgM test can cross-react, especially at a low level, with many other diseases, and people get tested routinely for Lyme disease because, because they've had some symptoms, which, and they come back as a positive Lyme IgM, and they're sent to me, and I have to explain to them that this Lyme IgM is really not due to the Lyme disease, it's due to cross-reactivity to some other infection.
you know, in terms of anaplasmosis, patients can get very sick with anaplasmosis very quickly. That's one disease. You need, if somebody comes in with fever, headache, chills, and they're quite sick, you do not wait for the test. You can blood, draw the blood because often the testing results don't come back right away. And I usually recommend those patients to be put on doxycycline, which is the drug of choice for both anaplasmosis as well as Lyme disease, if they do have Lyme disease. If somebody continues to be running a fever on dox doxycycline, then you need to worry about an infection called Babesia, which is a parasite, which is not killed by doxycycline. <coughs> I'm not going to go into the, no, no, the, the <laughs> recommended antibiotic therapy. It's, there are some controversies, but if you look at science, data, and my at least 40 years of experience, most patients require three to four weeks of antibiotics. And they get better, and if they have some symptoms, residual symptoms like fatigue or joint pain, that will go away in overtime period. Late stages, like somebody has a large joint effusion, may need more than uh, two, uh, two or three courses of antibiotics. Sometimes a lot of those patients don't respond to oral antibiotics, require IV antibiotics. Some people get long-term, some patients are given long-term antibiotic therapy. I've seen patients up to 16 months on antibiotics. That is not recommended. Just because you have a positive test, you don't give antibiotic. Or you say, I'm fatigued, I had some joint pain, you don't give a test, you don't keep giving antibiotic. It's really a bad thing to give long-term antibiotics because it alters your gut flora or a bacteria in your gut, which are normally very important for the immune system. And what happens is when you give antibiotics for a long time, this bacteria gets killed and their gut gets colonized by bacteria which are much more resistant, more difficult to treat if you get an infection with that bacteria. So I think that antibiotic therapy should be limited in terms of how long you treat. And there are some people who believe in long-term therapy. It's very controversial and I'm not going to get into that. Some preventive measures, simple things. Wear light, colored, protective clothing, long pants, long shirts, and wear a glove if you can, and spray your clothing with DEET 30%, and if you don't like DEET, you can use some of the um, uh, natural things like permethrin or picardin. You can get either one. And if you are somebody who is in like a landscaper, you can even, there are clothing that is impregnated with some of these. You can buy in some of the shops. Tuck your pants, legs, and your socks. Check your ch yourself, children, and your pets daily for ticks and carefully remove them. Shower after working outdoors because when you shower, you're likely to find the tick or at least hopefully it'll get washed away if you have a good shower. Now I think Jacqueline put some. <laughs> Ticks cannot jump, usually they're in your... The best place they like it is wet, leafy surface in the yard where there's a lot of um, wet leaves. And they love that kind of uh, And usually the other thing is you have a grass which is growing tall. When you walk through a tall grass, you likely come across this. That's a very common thing. People walk in the grass. You can go anywhere. You can get infected in your arms, in your armpits. Most often, people don't realize. Uh, I mean, I saw a lady 
I was walking in the emergency room one day, and I don't know what she came in. It happens to be somebody I know, and she would put her arms up here, and I happened to walk by to say hello to her, and I saw this rash, and I said, gee, you've got Lyme disease. <laughs> so I talked to the other doctor and I said, did you see the rash? It's just, you know, again, uh, the other thing I tell you, everybody's concerned with the deer. Deer, adult takes suck on deer, but the deer does not, you know, it's not a, a reservoir for the bacteria for Lyme disease. It only helps the ticks to multiply. It does not, because the deer blood is not conducive to the bacteria of the Lyme, Lyme bacteria. So the, really the deer is really one of the hosts, a host that keeps the cycle going in terms of uh, it helps uh, the ticks. And this, I think Jackie put this, all these, the, the way to <laughs> check your dog. Your, That's it. The female, NIMS stage is the one that's most critical. That's when you really transmit a lot of the tick-borne disease. Thanks. No, I mean, some of it is technical, and I've never given a talk to a place like this, so I mean, I might have been too technical. Just yeah. stand here. Yeah, you can just stand here. Um, I think you said the, that it was a bacterial infection, not a virus infection. Is that correct? Did I understand you correctly? The only virus that caused by tick in this area is the Powassan. Uh, all of them, Lyme disease, is caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a spider tick. It's a bacteria. That's why it is. It's a treatable disease, you know, there's a lot of misinformation stating it's not treatable, it hides in your body and it keeps coming back. That's not true. So antibiotics is what is used to treat. Yeah, that's right. For example, for Powassan virus, we don't have a, uh, it, uh, antibiotics don't work. In fact, we don't have a uh, treatment. Okay, I'm just putting that in question. Okay. What's the best way to remove one from your, say your arm? Because you, you want to get it all, but sometimes you try to get some, it's a little part that stays in. Well, I think the best way is to use a tweezer and remove it very slowly, little by little. If you can, if you need to, sometimes a lot of times patients come and say it's, it's still embedded, part of the tick. Yeah, as long as you, you know, put a little alcohol and then use the trees and try to remove it slowly. Or ask somebody else to remove it. Sometimes you can't really see it. My neighbor went to the walk-in clinic. She had one embedded. And the doctor took a cotton swab and in a circular motion right around the tip. Was it a, was it, 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 was it, did it have alcohol? I don't know if it was soap or anything, but well, I mean, it's wrong. Exactly you know, as I said, there is a sticky material that ticks secretes, which attaches to it. And maybe the, 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 if it is with the cotton swab, then you're using it, and hopefully, you remove the sticky substance, you're able to remove it much more easily. Well, I, I heard that you could put a little bit of Vaseline on a hot swab and then after a minute it suffocates them and then it will come off easier. Well, I do that with my cat. No? Well, I'm sure everybody has their own technique. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I, 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 I don't know. 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 I don't and if you can't do it, it's in a spot where you can't see or you can't move, ask for somebody else to do it. How much um, material, how much deep or, or uh, protection should somebody put on? Rather, the recommendation for deep is 30 percent. 30 percent deep. You don't have to use 100 percent deep. The recommendation is 30 percent. For all vector bone disease, whether it's mosquito bone or tick bone disease, the recommendation is 30%. Some people don't like to eat. And I see something else new being advertised, I don't know how effective it is. Zebra or something like that, but I don't know how effective it is. So, you know, the other thing is, if you have a large yard and you are an outdoor person, I mean, I would recommend getting it sprayed. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Now, the, the people that say they're spraying for ticks and mosquitoes, that takes care of the ticks? So, I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we have it four times this summer. Somebody comes four times. Yes, and I also have it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good that's why I have that yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I was curious about it. Sure. Could just get a walk. What's your question? She has a question. Oh, um, uh, with the anaplasmosis, you said neutrophil, neutropenia was the issue. Has there been any long term studies that once the patient was placed on an Okay. That there was any residual that last? No. Anaplasmosis, of course, like any disease, any infection can vary. Some people may, their, symptom, their symptoms may respond very spontaneously and get better without any treatment. And there is, then there's a group of people who continue to get sick, the fevers go, to, go up, the white counts go down, the platelets go down. Once you start treatment, they all come back and they recover completely and the treatment is two weeks of doxycycline. There really is no residual other than some fatigue from being sick. Horrible fatigue. Hmm? Horrible fatigue. Yes, you can have fatigue. Dr. Chaka, we have a question here. Uh, what is your view on Lyme disease causing learning problems for children and teens? I don't know if there is any data to show that. But, you know, I don't have any information regarding that, and I have not heard. So, I'm just looking to see if anybody else in the audience has any, um, in the virtual audience. Does anybody here have any further questions? I'm just going to double check. These are all my questions. Um, uh, this, uh, somebody's show, uh, there's a tick check. Is there such a thing as a tick check? Uh, uh, he wants to repeat the question. Can you repeat the question? Oh, okay. What is the view on Lyme disease? Um, oh, for children, right? So that was what we were talking about. Um, yeah, is there, is there, are there any other tick check? materials out there that somebody can check on for ticks or what do you mean exactly? I don't know if somebody says that um, maybe at home lines test or something <laughs> yeah they say, they say um, somebody showed me a device called tick check and to be able to remove a, chick, a tick from themselves like you know I we were just talking about that about how to remove ticks yeah, yeah I, I don't know if there's any device in there Viable where you can check, use it to check every day. I have not, I'm not heard of it. Somebody, maybe uh, maybe so they, they know something I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else just asked a question too. Um, if you pull an embedded tick off of you right away, is there still risk of getting Lyme disease, or does the tick need to be embedded in you for a certain length of time? That's a good question. For Lyme disease, 
it takes about 36 hours. The reason is because the bacteria are in the gut and they take about 36 hours to multiply and come to the foregut to get injected. But whereas in other tick-borne diseases like anaplasmosis and babesiosis, it may be much shorter. So you generally, first, the first question we ask, and people call and say, I have a tick bite. How long has it been on it? Do you know? If it's more than 36 hours, then it is, you can treat those patients with two doses of doxycycline mm -hmm. as a prophylactic therapy. Any other questions? Uh, I'm going to ask this question again because I have my lawn, my area sprayed, and they claim that it's a tick and mosquito. And you're saying that if it's sprayed for tick, then we don't need to worry about tick, or it still they could still survive. You know, it depends. You know, you know how long they've been. They should care, and if there's a lot of still humus material around the yard and it's not been properly sprayed. If it's been properly sprayed, I, okay. I think it should be, it should take care of it. I mean, again, you know, if it's not in your yard, you go to your daughter's place uh, for a cookout or something, there's a chance that you may get it. I do have a question. So I had a tick bite last year, called my doctor. I just immediately said I want the doxycycline. <laughs> And, uh, but then two weeks later, I got another tick bite because I like the woods. So <laughs> I get another one. And I said, can I have another round? And they were like, sure. So how many times can I do that in the summer without my dog to stop and me? Well, that question comes up. And I'm sorry, but I do. I just, they just and As long as two things. I think, one, we don't pay test ticks, number one. So we, we ask patients not to bring the ticks because there's no <laughs> point um, because if you can test a tick, it may have something that doesn't mean you got it. Right. Another thing, uh, from a financial point of view, the insurance doesn't cover <laughs> if, you, if you analyze the tick. So you'll have to pay it out of your pocket. Uh, Second thing, it's okay to take as long as you take two doses of 200 milligrams of doxycycline mm -hmm. as a single dose. During the summer months, if you get bit more than once, um, I mean three times, if you took 200 milligrams three times over the summer, I don't have any problem. Uh, what I have a problem is if somebody gives you for six months. Oh, uh, yeah. They give you that. If you six months. Six months. Oh, it lasts for six months. No, usually it's only a couple because I know that if it's yeah. only the other on, thing you have to, uh, other thing is you also have to understand when there's a tick bite, there is some amount of rash around the bite. That's due to the inflammation of the bite rather than due to line, especially if it occurs right away. So just because you have a little rash around the bite, that doesn't mean you have line because that's usually due to to the infection from the bite rather than due to the line. Because it's, for you to get the rash, it takes an average three to four weeks. So can it, can it really be um, transmitted through a, through a dog tick, or is it only deer ticks? The, the, this, the, the tick that is transmits is the particular tick. Yeah, the deer tick. Mm -hmm. OK. Because when I have a dog tick on me, I don't call. Yeah. <laughs> There are dog ticks which cause other things, oh, uh, okay. but not the same <laughs> usually. And depending on where you are, for example, there's Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which can in that certain parts okay. of the country where it's a different tick again. Yeah. Um, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, we have a question here. What is two, do what is two doses of doxy? Is that 14 days? One of your slides said three to four weeks is okay. the treatment. Please clarify. Okay. The drug of choice for Lyme disease, the first line is doxycycline. It's 100 milligrams twice a day for three to four weeks. The other drugs you can give if you, if you cannot tolerate doxycycline mm -hmm. because some people get GI upset. And if it is confirmed Lyme disease, again, if it's like anaplasmosis, you cannot give. You can give amoxicillin, or uh, uh, 
some of those drugs that can be alternately used. But so 14 days. Minimum 14 days for early disease. The recommendation is two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. Oh, I get two big 200 milligram pills and I take one, yeah, one that, day. Yeah, that, that is for prophylaxis. Oh. You're talking about treatment of disease. Oh, okay. That's for, right? Okay. I didn't know that was so yours is preventive. Yeah, mine is preventive. Okay. Yes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Anybody from the audience? Question? No? We hope you've answered your questions. Dr. Chai, you're Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody.